right, let's begin this session. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first FIBAN morning talks of the year. Uh, once a month, an experienced angel or industry expert is here sharing their knowledge, knowledge with us on a topic related to angel investing. And today's topic is uh, impact of angel investing and especially the study of it. Uh, my name is Oscar. I'm FIBAN's investment analyst, and I'm joined here at our office at Maria Sierra One by Peter Kelly, an award-winning entrepreneurship educator with experience from 27 countries, connector at Aalto University, and also visiting professor of business at Trinity College Dublin. Um, so maybe Peter, you can start with sharing a bit about your background and career history. <laughs> well, in a snapshot, uh, I've, I've lived now in four countries. I'm born and raised in Canada, uh, did my MBA in Notre Dame in the United States, a very famous university. Uh, I then moved into uh, banking and I had it within a five year period, a really interesting journey through the banking business, small business. Then I moved to the corporate desk, handled investment banking, worked with a bunch of entrepreneurs in the cable television business. Uh, wherein I, I arranged a strategic investment. I took a company public. We did a lot of merger and acquisition activity. Uh, I then did a gig as a consultant with one of my clients because I decided banking wasn't the thing I want to do for the rest of my life. Uh, got my dibbles into university teaching, then moved to England where I worked at London Business School. And I've been here now since 98, actually. So. I know the process of taking things public. I've had an angel investment myself that actually was profitable. Uh, and I've worked with an awful lot of people, both executives and students throughout the years. And sort of a claim to fame is Ilka Pananen was in my class the very first year I was in <laughs> Finland. It was a pretty special group, as well as Timo Ahopelto and Jaakko Olola were sitting in the front <laughs> row. So I, I realized then it was a really special place to be. So I've been happy to be here. It's hard to believe it's been over 20 years. Thank you very much. Before we get into the, the topic of the day, we will start with a bit of warm up session also for, for the online audience. So uh, if you could go to menti.com and log in with the code you see on the screen, uh, we have a, a question for you to spark some thoughts about uh, research on angel investing and uh, what, come, what can um, come up from, from that um, endeavor. Do you, Peter, have any, any thoughts on, on the question? In what respect do you think angels best can benefit from research on, on angel investing? Well, I mean, I had to dust off my, my PhD thesis of 20 some odd years ago uh, in advance of this, this uh, invitation. And I realized then actually the sample that I was dealing with is probably still the core research need we have. I tapped into the experience of a very experienced group of angels and tried to get them to share their experience because there's an awful lot of novices in this market, a lot of that you know want to invest and, and we call them latent uh, angels. They, they have the resources to invest, but something prevents them or inhibits them from actually pulling the trigger and, make, and, trigger and making that first investment. And I, I saw some benefit from actually tapping into the experience base. Mm. And uh, they're an interesting group. They're very hard, very, very, very hard uh, to dig into. Took me an awful long time to build my own little network. Uh, my doctoral dissertation was basically the seedlings of an angel network. So it was an interesting uh, piece of research, very engaging insights, which hopefully we'll have a chance to yeah. share some of them here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll dig into that later on. Let's see what we have on the screen then, what our online audience thinks. There's quite a lot of evaluating startups, new opportunities, Focus on essential insight, support, benchmarking, data. Yes, yes, I love that. Interesting insights, evaluating startups. <clears throat> wow, quite a lot. Uh, thank you all for, for sharing. Um, maybe let's then continue to the actual discussion and the, the topic of the day. Um, so I want to start off with, uh, you already mentioned your, your PhD in entrepreneurial <coughs> finance at uh, London Business School. And you also have done extensive research on, on angel investing in the early 2000s. So 
Could you maybe place us where you were and what the angel industry in Europe looked like at the time of your research? Uh, yeah, happy to do so. Um, I was quite, uh, I, I had an entrepreneur in me that I didn't quite realize. And when I first showed up at the door of LBS, I was assigned to this supervisor who was a professor of entrepreneurship. And I said, I'm, I'm a strategy guy. What the heck am I doing with a guy who's a professor of entrepreneurship? And I remember our first meeting, I, I said, I don't know, Michael, what you've read about me, but um, there must be a reason we're together. And I'm going to completely throw out my research proposal and explore something that is, is of relevance and of interest. And so I went and asked the students. I went to an entrepreneurship class. LBS is an incredibly international place. Average age in the, in the class, about 35 to 40. Uh, very expensive program. These are people from all over the world. And the thing that I discovered from that group very early on 20 years ago is they also had this fear of how do you take this first step? Where do you go raise money? And there was a, mount, a lot of interest in playing what was called the venture capital game. And as I, I quickly started to discover, I thought that actually looking at angels, because we had a lot of them inside our alumni, we are just starting to do, to do some research on that, that this could be something really worthwhile to have a look at. So I, I fashioned, and I'm not a typical academic. I know I had to get my PhD union card and I wanted to do something meaningful. And, and I did a dissertation that was a, a completely different one than, and mass, than creating a massive data set. I actually created a network that was my deliverable. And it took an awful lot of time and I had an awful lot of, I was invited to a lot of cocktail parties and to dinners and meeting people. And these are individuals that once you build their trust, they love talking and sharing experience. And I was, I was flabbergasted at the experience of some of these people. In fact, I remember one guy walking into my office uh, for an interview. We, it was three hours. It was supposed to be uh, half an hour, 45 minutes. It ended up being three hours. This is a man who walked in and said, well, I think my portfolio is about a hundred million pounds uh, in, in angel investments. I've got maybe 75, 80 of them. And, and I said, so where's your office? It's in a barn. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe. And the number of people that, that were like this, that came out of the woodwork wanting to have a conversation was uh, fantastic. And in fact, my data collection was probably most unique. Uh, I organized a cocktail event. We had a, a session at the school before a dinner and cocktail event. Uh, and I have to say that that networking event was probably the biggest buzz event I've ever attended, even to this day. The noise in there was incredible. And it was only investors. It was invitation only and only investors. And I discovered one thing uh, out of that that probably still resonates today the investors thought it was a fabulous experience. I mean, the president of the school came in and he said, wow, look at, look at this room. And to give you a sense of the kind of people we're talking about, uh, I believe I, on this back of a survey, if memory serves, I think they had created 6 billion pounds in self-made wealth. Uh, their average investments were something like three or four active investments. And we're talking about people who could just, you know, with a blink of an eye, write a check for a hundred thousand pounds and not even think twice. And they loved the fact that they were in a room with other investors and no entrepreneurs. And this, this was really, and I had been working with some angel networks at that time, it had just been started up in the UK. And we were addressing a need that these angel networks seemingly weren't, which is the investors wanted to build a network of relationships amongst themselves in addition to getting deal flow. And I still think this is a central problem, particularly for people who are relatively new to the game. Mm. So, <clears throat> so your PhD, I already mentioned that your PhD research also spawned the creation of, of two angel networks, yes. Enterprise 100 in London and the Irish Angels in, in the US. Yes. Uh, could you tell us the story of how this <laughs> came to be? Uh, well, it's... <laughs> If, if anybody out there wants to have a chat with me about how to do a PhD, don't do it my way. It took me far too long, but it was an extremely interesting uh, journey and, and I wouldn't have done it any other way. The, when I had done my basic research, one of the alumni came to me and he said, you know what? I'm, I'm really surprised that you're reaching out to people and they seem to have some connection to the school. We ought to generate a club. So the idea was not mine. It was actually a colleague and alum from the business school named Peter Bennett. And he took charge and he basically asked the school, he said, we need a space, we'd like to meet regularly. 
and and there was a rule you had to be have lunch with peter before you were invited in as a member and it was it was kept so it was invitation only and this this was an important element about the club and and over the years the working model started to emerge the they met every two months uh they had a very specific format at the beginning because the members wanted this. They had a block of time to meet amongst themselves. And this was incredibly important because the element of trust to build a syndicate uh, is also a huge undertaking. This is a basically an investment in somebody's social capital. And I, I saw, because I was sitting in a number of these meetings, that these investors were also basically getting buy-in to say, I'm meeting new people, I'm building my network, and we all know that to build a trusting network takes time. And this was kind of the lubrication to create syndicates within the club. And the basic rule of the club was this. Uh, they would, at the meeting, after these informal networking sessions where they'd be meeting entrepreneurs as well, uh, five or six hand-picked opportunities would be presented. Now, what means by hand-picked? You needed a faculty member to say this was somebody who's ready to present. And the other interesting element was every single proponent who presented before the club had to have attracted the attention of a mentor from within the club. So that there's somebody within the, in the club itself who's actually, if you were Oscar going to make a, a pitch to this, and, and if I were a member of Enterprise 100, and I say, oh, there's something about Oscar I really like and about this proposition, I'm gonna sit in his back pocket for a while and work with him. That's what I consider to be angel due diligence. And then when I feel you're ready, I may, you're allowed to make a pitch to the club. And the expectation was, but it almost became a standing commitment that if the mentor thought you were ready, they also were putting money in. So that the proponent would stand up, the mentor would stand up. And then you can imagine when they have a club meeting and said, now who wants in? You, and in, you, there's an openness and in sharing inside this club. And to give you an idea of the amount of money that was raised, one of my students went in worked with one of the mentors, a very amazing guy. He was in his early 40s, started seven businesses, had invested in, I think, 14 or 15. Just picture how busy this guy must have been. He had worked with this, this proponent and said, she is the most talented entrepreneur I've ever met. I'm willing to put my money in. They hand out chip, the chits of paper and, and say who's in and for how much. At the end of that, she had raised 2,750,000 pounds on the floor. And to give you an idea, over time, I just checked before I came here. 900 million in capital has been raised by businesses that are presented before the club. And uh, one measure that, that is tracked in angel markets is called yield. And I'm not talking about returns. Yield is what chance when you make a presentation as a proponent, do you actually raise money? And the higher the number, the better, which means the quality of the network, 45% of the proponents who actually presented raise cash, which is astoundingly high. Now, this, I asked a member after, I've been back to, to London uh, several times since, and I'll let you in a little secret, it's not the money. Why the mentors wanted to join is they wanted to work with, or why the angels wanted to join is they want to really mentor the next generation. That was the more important thing. And the mentoring decision and investment of time then became an investment in money. And I think too often, young entrepreneurs think angels are about money. No, it's capturing their imagination, their time and their experience and, and that's the due diligence they do. And somehow these two things ought to be fused together. Uh, I have to say one big opportunity that could come out of Enterprise 100's experience is they approached the school and, and a number of the investors actually wanted to go into class to work with the entrepreneurs, students in the classroom. They were basically told by the dean no, which I thought was surprising because that's a basic due diligence test and you might ask, well, why did they say no? Well, the Dean said that if, if a mentor came in and joined a team, then it would not be fair for the, the groups that didn't have one of these investor mentors. We could talk about that later, but Irish angels, uh, uh, Notre Dame, uh, the fighting Irish football team. Uh, when I was in London doing my PhD, I was phoned by the head office in the US and they said, would you like to meet one of our alums in Dublin? We'll fly you over for Dublin to meet him. He flew over to Dublin in his private jet. Sure, he's an entrepreneur. I, I, I won't, he, he was a, uh, had a large shareholding as chief marketing officer in a company called Vizio, which got sold to Microsoft in 2000 for a billion and a half dollars. So all you need to do is connect one dot to another to realize this guy's got money. 
the school had been after him for about five years to engage. And, and U.S. is all about donations. And they were having trouble. I met this guy and within 15 minutes, he decided, I asked him the, the one question that the university should have asked him, what gets you excited, Gary? And down came the list. And he, and he was most interested in hearing about this Enterprise 100. He went back to South Bend and said, we're going to create this Irish Angels Club. And he asked me in 15 minutes, so how much do you think it's going to need to take off? And I went, oh, uh, well, uh, you know, a lot of things, a business plan competition, a center and a fund, $2 million. How much if you come along with it? And, I, and unfortunately, I didn't have my PhD at that time ready. And I said, if I don't have a union card, I can't play. But we're talking probably $5 million. And he said, well, done. I'm prepared to do that. And the astounded look of the university was amazing. Something that had taken them five to seven years of hard negotiating, 15 minutes unlocks money. And to give you an idea, I've, I've just quickly checked to be a member. There's 276 members in that club at the moment. You're, you're committed to invest 10,000 10, a year and to give, donate at least eight hours of your time every three months. And they have invested a total of $40 million in 50 ventures in that club. These are what I call affinity angel clubs. And, and they're an extremely interesting feature of some of these schools like MIT, Stanford, uh, Harvard, Yale, uh, Waterloo, where I'm from, uh, LBS, INSEAD, IESA. This seems to be a feature of these affinity clubs, something, again, I think maybe worth some study. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. I, I just want to maybe dig a little bit deeper into the Enterprise 100. You mentioned that you yeah. had a, a, was it yield rate of 45%? Yes. Percent. Um, here at, at FIBA, we have around 4%. But then again, uh, most of the due diligence is, is done after the, um, the opportunity has been presented to, to the FIBA members, of course, through yeah. our deal flow manager. Um, but I, I was wondering then how, like, what was the actual number of, of deal flow opportunities to Enterprise 100? I mean, if, if every angel is participating in the team already before it is presented, then that takes a lot of resources from, from the angels. So, so what, are well, the, what were the actual numbers? Um, not as much as you think, actually. I mean, if I, if I look at Carol, who raised almost 3 million pounds, she had a lead mentor and a lead investor in a group. And there was an awful lot of what I call passive investing going on in that group. As soon as the mentor stood up and said, you're talented, that was due diligence enough for most club members to say, here's the money. And that could shift because, you know, if you're meeting six times a year, five or six, five or six opportunities being presented to the club, you're talking 30 to 40 opportunities a year, very crafted. Now, one has to also, are you stage ready? This is another thing about angel investing is when you push entrepreneurs to say, you got to go raise capital and you turn around and talk to the CEO. And this I've seen this oftentimes in, in this country and say, well, yes, I'll, I'll go through the exercise of raising money. Well, you're prepared to give up equity? No, you're not ready. And that would drive your yield rate down <laughs> a lot. So there was an awful lot of nurturing to say, do you really know what you're getting yourself into? Do I really know about you as a due diligence? And there was an awful lot of open sharing. Now, what made that thing work brilliantly is you need this networking development among the members. That's the only way. If you have trust among the members inside the club and, and you know, they have to find themselves and they have to play fair. And so you might ask, so why would they becoming club members? They want, there was a desire upon the school to actually make LBS an entrepreneurial place. And if they hit it big, they might donate. There was no obligation, but they might donate back. And that's the kind of way, that's the Stanford model uh, to a T. Build what you do with the Stanford network. Remember where you, you know, if the network is very powerful, it's helping you actually develop and raise money and credibility. And if you happen to have great success, then you give back. That's the American model. And it's, it's kind of why the angel market has taken off like, uh, like firecrackers in the U.S. market, because there is no government and there is this philosophy of give back. And a lot of the angel networks focus around areas where there are universities, where knowledge is being created. And so we have all the ingredients here in Europe to do this. And I think this has been the lingering question is, so why does Europe seem to be so much less active in this field? And, and I think part of that has to do with the fact that 
we have to remember the U.S. doesn't have a functioning government. Despite what happened yesterday, the U.S. does not have a functioning government. There is no uh, equivalent of a business Finland to go and get a grant. You want to check out an idea, you have to go talk to an angel. Or you raise money from your family. And it's very Darwinian. And, and here we have at least a safety net, which is a good thing. You don't have much of a safety net in the U.S., but the dynamic of actually hitting up against some very serious players at arm's length very early on is a dynamic we ought to think about. Try, how do we actually bring this into this kind of system mm -hmm. while still re retaining, I think, the benefits of having a very active and engaged public sector to help provide this kind of safety net and stimulus when it's needed? Yeah. Is there any other ways? Did you see that um, a small economy like Finland could maybe learn from, well, from UK and the US and maybe build above its weight in growing companies? I, I want to go back to one one particular touch point I had with Enterprise 100, which stuck with me uh, to this day. They would have what an annual celebration meeting where they'd get dressed up in black ties and it'd be a very fancy event at the school, but they'd have guest speakers. And the guest speaker for this particular event was the minister responsible for, for business. Uh, and she was a very opinionated lady. And she actually came in to the room, and, and this is something that I, I remember seeing this, it, the timing was, was absolutely before the U, UK had put these government initiatives in to try and help stimulate uh, university challenge funds, science enterprise schemes. But the stimulus came because this, this government minister came into the room, and we have something called Churchill rules. When the doors close, what goes on and is said in the room stays in the room. And she said, well, gentlemen, uh, I don't have any of my handlers in this room with me at all. And I know there's some permanent staff who always want my ear, but I'm here to listen very carefully. You tell me what you need. And she was taking, she was asking very perceptive questions, taking notes and going back to the department. And, and I think that's an amazing, there's an amazing sounding board. It's not lobbying in, a, in a kind of that, what we normally think of lobbying as, you're advocating positions inside a room. And that's, I think, the benefit of a network. I don't know what it's actually been done here in Finland, but a lot of very good things came out when you have a group of very active angel investors saying, this, this is where we think the problems are. This is where we think policy should be shifted and changed. And then it went back to a minister to go back and put this into a government department. And to give you an idea, I think I have no proof of this, but my hunch, given the messages. The University Challenge Fund scheme came, came out of that meeting as an idea, was fully formed and adopted by the Minister of Finance within two months. And then a call was made. I was, and this was when Tony Blair was, was Prime Minister. They were looking for some big bang uh, entrepreneurial, you know, how do we get more entrepreneurship out of our universities? It can happen. And is it a lobbying organization? Well, no. But a selected club of very active investors, these are opinion leaders who could openly and, and privately say, you don't know who the members are until you actually make a presentation and you walk into a room and say, who's here? Uh, it's, it's a, there's a mystique about being a club. There's lots of people want to be in that club. Uh, I, I didn't mention number. I think at any one time, it's about 75 active members. And over time, there has been, you can make touch points of people who've been in the paper, opinion leaders who are there to offer their opinions. And when they get comfortable, the real benefit I see for the students is here's this immense wealth of experience, but it is Darwinian. This is not charity, this is Darwinian. And, and they, want to, they want people, this is a full contact sport. They don't want this as an academic exercise. And I think there's an enormous scope to do that in this market here, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. And do you think, I'm I'm wondering like what the dynamics behind the, uh, the the minister actually, or or let's put the question this way: um, What are the dynamics you think behind being put on the radar of a minister um, of of a government as an as an angel group? Like what? How, how does that come to be? Well, and I, I I'm. I've done this kind of study, which I shared with Oscar about the, the businesses that have been through the startup uh, sauna system. If I were the minister of finance of any country, 
there's no secret to the business model of Finland. We need more taxpayers, full stop. I sit on a board, an advisory board, an international director's advisory board with ACO. And their remit, and it's been in the paper, is that we need more foreign talent to come to Finland. Well, here's a provocative idea. And I know my friends at Business Finland have been reaching out. If you're an entrepreneur, come and base yourself in Finland with your idea. Actually, we're missing most of the iceberg. The competition for those kind of things is global. And so, you know, are you really going to get the highest growth businesses? Uh, if they really think they're high growth, they're going to probably go to Silicon Valley or to some other bigger market. The bigger pool are entrepreneurial talent who don't have an idea. And if we can kind of embrace foreign talent like that, then actually what, what is required is a networking challenge, is how do you network inside this country? And I see an enormously important interface between a, a network like FIBAN and a group like this, and our friends at Business Finland. And networking is, it, it, it's hard, bloody work, but it's the underpinning of an angel market. It's the key thing that an entrepreneur absolutely needs. And in fact, I've, I've discussed this with colleagues. I think there's a, you know, it's one of these aha, duh, so obvious things we should be studying that has just basically passed under the radar for 20 years. And it's the single most important thing for an entrepreneur and for an investor is to know how to network professionally. And I think network platforms like FeeBan, that's, it's the networking element of it that is the, probably the most important thing of your proposition. And it's, it's even escaped my attention. You know, this is, if, if you want to build sales traction as a high growth startup, you need to know who to sell to. That's a network. And the network that trusts you that when you're making the call, the answer is yes, not who the heck are you? What's, what's your background and how did you hear about me? And this is the game we need to accelerate and play. And this would be an incredibly interesting market to do this. The network happens in places like Silicon Valley just by design. I think it needs a bit more of a nudge in places like this, <laughs> but it's equally important. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We are, the time is time is running faster, faster than uh, it would have helped. I think we could continue this discussion maybe for hours at least, <laughs> but uh, we want to take some <clears throat> questions from the audience as well. So, so let's get to the Q and A part of, of this session. Um, can we get the Menti? Yeah, so, so we ask again all the online participants to go to menti.com and uh, use the code. Let's see what the code is. 3099140 zero and uh present your your questions for for peter but peter maybe while we while we wait for for the audience to to think of their and write down their thoughts um i i'm currently writing my master's thesis on angel investing so do you have any any great advice for me <laughs> <laughs> well i mean surprising is as i was preparing for this when you invited me i had to kind of blow the dust off a lot of this work that i had done 20 years ago and some of the questions that I had raised then still aren't answered today. And there's some, there's some big ones. I, I think we've done a lot of demographic research. We know how big it is, how active it is, but the, how to build a network among, how to build a syndicate, which all of the, the information we're seeing from the US is, it is not only a, in, angels are not only a big game, they're also a syndicate game. I mean, the average deal, just to give the audience a feel, in the U.S. right now, $300,000, 300,000 euros, five investors. Now, that's enormously big, I think, compared to, uh, compared to the Finnish market. Uh, and e uh, even frighten you a bit more, venture capitalists, the average investment of a seed investment of a venture capitalist now in the U.S. is $2 million. And, and so this whole notion of how do you syndicate, how do you build trust? Secondly, I think we often assume that venture capitalists, that angels do, are the farm team and venture capitalists follow on. Uh, venture capital is morphing into something I don't understand mm -hmm. in the US. It's a mega deal, mega fund approach. And their money goes in with preference rights that actually say to the angels, basically, 
oh, okay, good. You've done all the hard work at the high risk end, and now your equity is not as good as mine. I'm the serious player. You're not. I've got the deep pockets. You're not. And in fact, these two markets have been showing signs that they are, in fact, not compatible. Mm. And that's that, that to me is also quite interesting. Um, and and this whole crowdfunding aspect of it. Yeah. I remember it, distinctly investors telling me they do not like to see a lot of minority investors in deals. And the other bigger thing, and, and this is one that's been prickling all along, is an element of basically the club. One of the most prominent members of the club came to me and basically said, you know what? I don't like networks making things more transparent at all. If I see a gold nugget, I want to see the gold nugget to myself and share it with people that I want to bring into a deal. And I, I then turned around and asked this man, well, you know, you've got enormous experience as an angel investor. Uh, that sounds rather constricting. So how would somebody who's a relative novice build a trust into your network? And then we had this very interesting conversation. So I think there's, uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions, um, but I'm particularly interested in the one of how to build networks, mm. how to build trust in networks. Yeah, definitely. That's one of the major topics of the network. Let's see, we have at least one question from the, the online audience at the moment. So with 45% yield uh, in the club, versus 4% in FIBAN. I understand there is very rigid screening prior to pitching, but still interested. What kind of yield actual returns the investors have got? Do you have any statistics on that? I, I've been, uh, they've been very secretive. This is one of the things about a club. Uh, and, and, and one also has to say that, you know, we don't know what the returns look like on angel deals because it's a very discreet marketplace. And in fact, we don't really know the returns on venture capital funds that well until they have to disclose to raise more money. Um, I can tell you that that the two students that I know directly that went through this, one has had two exits uh, and had had brought her, her network and her syndicate along on two different deals and in, in two completely different realms. Another one who I had worked with in class who developed his business plan, presented to the club, has gone through two MBOs out of this deal. And increasingly, the first one was valued at sort of 2 million and then it went to 19 million and then it went to 60 million. So I think the returns have been quite good. Uh, I'm, I'm most heartened by the fact that 900 million euros of capital has been raised among these businesses. It's quite big, but this is something that, you know, we have to measure this impact in a lot. You know, how many jobs are being created? Uh, how many taxes are being paid? Uh, actually to that level, because that's something that a minister of finance, who is, you know, particularly in a country like Finland, where you have a lot of public support. If the business model of Finland doesn't have enough tax revenue, we're in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. And, but equally, anybody who's saying we're helping to develop an economy, we should be measuring this stuff. Uh, and it's, it, it's a big open issue about, and I think we're long overdue to have an impact uh, report. And in fact, one piece of research that was done in London a long time ago, which maybe should be done here, we had a very talented alum do something called Investing for the Future, which looked at these tax implications for various policy changes. And it became, a, it became an internal document among the government to say, so how do we help? And I think maybe we've actually reached this point here because you know, I've looked at the summer of startups, uh, just top line numbers. That entire cohort has generated a loss of 10 million euros. So the job creation wasn't quite there. It looks like 40% of them actually didn't stay along uh, in existence or they, they either closed themselves down or they, they basically went dormant. Uh, they reach a certain point and then they stop, which as a taxpayer in Finland worries me a lot because if we say we're, we're developing high growth businesses, then our customers necessarily outside of Finland. And then how do you resolve that with, with a, a, a funding body in Finland whose remit is to make Finland a better place and Finland's business model a better thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it, what we need to do is develop networks outside. Outside of Finland. Outside of Finland and also to bring more diversity of entrepreneurial talent inside Finland. Uh, and I think that's, I get this aha moment when I, I, I mention this because a lot of countries are after gold nuggets. I think the gold nugget in the person is far more interesting than the gold nugget venture. 
and and the the glitter that we see. I mean, you just have to look at Silicon Valley at the moment. In the U.S., this mega model, every thirty six hours, a mega deal is done, and a mega deal is a hundred million plus. That's a completely different model than what we see here in and I think we ought to take a little bit of the eyes away from the 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 glittery gold of the Silicon Valley approach and say, we are smaller, we're a lab. We do experimentations brilliantly. We can get things done very quickly, but it's also a very homogenous network. And that's the challenge. If we're going to break out into a high growth mode, I think we need a lot more diversity in the investor base and a lot more diversity of the founder pool. And I suspect that, you know, I'm beginning to think after, after such a long time reflection, we're onto something here. The time is right to do this kind of thing. It's been something that has been ignored. And it's this kind of aha moment I've been hearing with researchers. I just talked to a guy, he, he did his PhD dissertation in networking 20 years ago. I've known this guy more than that. And he went, duh, this is so obvious. This is, you know, and, and he's looking very carefully at this work from the research side. So I think there's something in this that, a game that we can start to fashion because this is in, in fact a great place it but it is small small in size small in numbers operates with a different mentality yeah so we have a, a second question from the online audience what do you think about cross-border networks uh, angels from from different countries well I remember that they were talking about, and this will date myself, they were talking about in Finland, Citra was talking about creating an angel network. That's how long I've been here. EBAN, uh, the, UK, the UK Business Angel Network, the London Business Angel Network. It, the, this is one of the dilemmas of angel investing. It is by nature a very local, a geographically uh, bounded activity. You want, you want to be very actively involved with an investee company. The challenge of developing these relationships across borders is it, it's, it's not, how do you build trust in a network with somebody, for example, a Finnish investor trying to build a, a trusting relationship with an Italian investor? That takes time. And, and networking is going through, no like and trust. Well, I might get to know you because you've registered for an angel network, and you might, I might have had a positive impression, but we haven't done anything together. And, and so where is this kind of element of the meeting before the meetings of Enterprise 100, that kind of dynamic in doing this cross-border? Because it, inherently, it's going to be passive. And, and maybe one of the conversations we, we ought to have, and one of the things of, of mixing more nationalities at the front end, is that these people bring networks that don't overlap with founders in Finland, that's, that's what I mean by diversity. Diversity of nationality, diversity of age, diversity of function, diversity of industry. And we look pretty monolithic compared to other markets. Uh, and perhaps the bridge can be built in answer to that question in an indirect way. We build more diversity here locally. We might start to build these trusting bridges yeah. to other markets. But this, this does take some effort. It doesn't happen automatically. You want to do something together. That's what, that's what, how you become a, a trusted connection of somebody is you have what, what's called a, a, an experiment, a trust experiment. Let's do something together. It's very, it, it's necessary, but it's very challenging. Yeah, exactly. So a third question. Uh, oh, damn, I can, can't see the question because it's behind, <laughs> behind the uh, bar there. Uh, if foreign people coming to Finland to found a startup don't have a business idea, uh, where do you think they should get ah. the idea? <laughs> well, I've been raising this idea because I was sitting in on uh, Business Finland has got this Made in Finland series last year they're running. And uh, they're trying to get foreign talent to come. And I was sitting observing this, watching the chatterbox, you know, and, they're, and they were asking basic questions. Can I get a scholarship? Uh, can I work in Finland? Uh, can I bring my spouse along with Finland? Can my kids get schooling? I said, this, is, this sounds very opportunistic. This doesn't sound like a network operating. Uh, we have these areas of expertise. So we ought to be very, we, we ought to be very clear as, as a country what kind of skills and experience we are looking for, asking tough questions of them. And equally, the people who live overseas should be asking tough questions of us 
and then it becomes a networking challenge. Uh, it was plainly obvious watching these people that you'd say, well, this is, we'd have to build an experience from scratch to basically say, how do you build this no like trust relationship and have people open up their networks, develop trust experiments and, and make it dead easy for people to stay. This is a completely another issue is that a lot, and this is what we found at the advisory board, a lot of uh, foreign students come here and then they leave because it's too damn difficult mm. and they want to stay. And this, this breaks my heart. I have a lot of foreign students in my class. And, and so there is, there is an interface related issue, which the government is desperately trying to deal with. But there's also this issue of how do you feel like you're part of the network and part of the club? And I remember that Yuri Hackett Mies said to me in the first advisory board meeting that Finland is a club. And I said, well, that is both a benefit and it's also the biggest challenge. How do you become a club member? And it's, Finland this is quite a tight society. And if this is a game that you truly want to play, then we need to bring a bit of more diversity into this. The experience isn't quite there yet. And we do have to run these experiments. This is not just showing up, having a coffee, 15 minutes and doing kind of a matching. People have to find each other. Yeah. And, and you don't know whether it's right. And it's a trust experiment for, a, for example, a foreigner coming here to say, well, you know, I don't have an idea to my heart, but I am interested in AI. Marvelous. Then if you're here, who are the experts in AI? Who are the networks in AI? Who do you need to be known to? Who would you like to be known to? Who needs to know of you? And then you build these collisions in. And whilst doing that, it's a chance for us to assess, you know, is the fit right for them? Is the fit right for us? And, and to find themselves. This is something that my students just fumble and bumble and stumble around. <laughs> and, and I think we desperately do need to think more in a more structured way of how you do strategic networking. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> we are running running out of time so maybe we should wrap up this uh, q a session as well and, and the session as a whole so uh, we are i am going to present you the uh, upcoming sessions of of fiban morning talk let's see if we get the slide so yeah there it is um, so the next Fibon morning talk session is on the 11th of February. Um, our um, team member Vasim is going to interview Marina Vahtola about the topic of building an angel investor brand. Uh, highly, highly current topic for, for every single investor. Uh, and then we have on the March 11th and 8th of April, so you can already mark those those Thursday mornings in your calendar. Um, thank you for, for joining and stay tuned and follow our newsletters and, and social media to get the latest information from FIBAN and uh, all members. Uh, remember to answer the annual survey of investments. You should have a link in your email and uh, Remember that your, your answers are more important than ever this year as we are trying to navigate the impact of COVID on the Finnish startup ecosystem. Uh, thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you all for joining online as well. And see you next month. Have a great Thursday, everyone. <laughs>